Mohan Eddy, medical director and founder of the ASCA Codependency Centers in Bellflower, California, an inpatient and outpatient treatment center and educational and training program to promote better understanding of codependency and abuse. I have very little respect for psychiatric hospitals, and I have very little respect for psychiatrists. And uh, as my friends uh, in uh, social work and uh, counseling and the other areas know about me, uh, I have some difficulty seeing myself as being grouped with psychiatrists because in almost every way, I don't think like the majority of them. <laughs> The codependency unit is different because the emphasis on, on, in the codependency unit, which again specializes in problems coming from a background of abuse, which include chronic depression, theories of hopelessness, suicidal tendencies, uh, quote unquote borderline type of problems, eating disorders, uh, secondary chemical dependency problems. And again, I know there might be people here that come from uh, AA and NA background, and this is not to not knock down anything that's being done in AA and NA, which I feel is really wonderful programs that have strengthened and will continue to strengthen many people. The things that we do a little different is we focus on treating the roots of the problem. And the roots of the problem in all these disorders, whether it's, it's addictive relationships or addictive habits, or depression, anxiety problems is the untreated child. It's a child that has not had a chance to blossom, a child that has been suppressed and repressed and beaten into silence. And for us at the Codependency Center, talking about uh, healing the child within is not a matter of using a certain term that has become very popular in the last few years but something that we do all the time, every time, with every person, because we feel in doing that, that is the only way to help the recovery. And some of the things that we do differently is that we have a tremendous emphasis on exercise, because exercise is empowerment, and exercise is giving oneself deep inside a certain strength of knowing that they can move and, and fight back and run away and change things, move from lousy jobs and lousy boyfriends and lousy girlfriends and, and, and lousy children and lousy parents, <laughs> right? And uh, we also have a lot of emphasis on massage and body work, which is very, very different from any other hospital that I have worked in or trained in in the Southern California area or anywhere in this country. There is no... Psychiatrists are afraid of touching the body, see? There are old jokes, of course, about... Uh, who becomes psychiatrist, you know. I, I will say this one at the, at the cost of being called uh, racist, but I really don't mean that. But this is a joke that was told to me when I was, in, I was in medical school, and who becomes a psychiatrist? It's a Jewish doctor that doesn't like blood. You know, this is the joke. Okay? So, <laughs> yeah. But uh, psychiatrists don't like to touch the body, and even though... Somewhere in the back of their mind, there is a connection between what happens with quote-unquote psychiatric illnesses in the brain. Their actual attempt to look at what is happening in the brain is very limited. So in addition to strongly looking at the individual in terms of their past and what has brought them to that point where they're demonstrating eating disorders, chemical dependency, dissociative episodes, which is disorders of memory, uh, sexual perversion, uncontrollable violent behavior, self-destructive behavior. We also, very strong happening inside the brain itself. And this is something that we do very differently from, from most hospitals. We do, and I will show you more of that, we do very elaborate tests to look at, look at the brain, kind of like PET scans. We do spec studies outside the hospital. We do brain imaging, this computer. Which is uh, daily massage and body work. A very healing process for people that come from a background of abuse who simply cannot verbally be gotten in touch with the pain inside we feel can only be gotten in touch by touching and holding by people that have 
accomplish uh, that level of, of done by the therapist. It isn't done by me, but we have people that are trained to do that that work. Some of you may have seen this, but I kind of wanted to open up uh, the, the talk with uh, previous methods of quote-unquote mental health and mental health help. Uh, even though we don't uh, do these things to the same degree these days, I think it points to a side of psychiatry and mental health that is very dehumanizing. And uh, the thing that I'm focused on most of all in treating adult survivors and children is the problems of dehumanizing. Because people that are dehumanized tend to dehumanize others. And uh, one of the reasons why I've had to take a second look at the field that I'm in is because of the tremendous amount of dehumanizing that takes place within the field itself. The first one. Okay, can we have the lights off? Oh, I don't know. I think it can, it can be seen dark with lights. Yeah. In its simplicity itself, one merely inserts the loop of tongue beneath the eyelid, breaking through the bone, pressing it up into the prefrontal lobe, manipulating it so as to sever the nervous connections of the thalamofrontal radiation to the body of the brain, to demonstrate not only the simplicity but also the speed of the process. I will perform transorbital lobotomy on 10 patients within an hour. These patients will be given mild doses of electroshock to sedate them, although I should point out that the procedure is completely painless. I have performed it many times while the patient remained awake. From a clinical standpoint, it is quite fascinating to watch the change take place. Now we know that lobotomy works, but now we can apply it on a much larger scale. The old way, prefrontal technique, required a full day's work by a surgical team to treat a single patient. In the same time, working alone, I can treat 50. My method is inexpensive, it's fast, and it's safe. It's only a little more dangerous than operating to remove an infected tooth. In plain language, my ice pick technique severs the nerves that deliver emotional energy to ideas. Along with the cure comes a loss of affect, a kind of emotional flattening with diminished creativity and imagination. After all, it is their imaginations and emotions that are disturbed. However, here, we'll soon be leaving the hospital. Lobotomy gets them home. This is, of course, not a commonly used procedure. It still goes on, just in case you don't know, it still goes on. But it's very hard to get a lobotomy these days, thank God. But um, I have seen patients that were lobotomized quite frequently. And um, when I was in Boston, working in a very large state hospital, part-time, literally, you know, I have several hundred patients on a, on a ward, and the only thing that I would ask them was if they had slept well, because uh, if they hadn't slept well, that means they were not doing well, and sleep is a good indicator of where somebody is. But uh, one of the older attendants told me that back in the 50s, they would have up to eight deaths on a Monday when they would do the lobotomy, and lobotomy is not supposed to be a uh, surgery with a great lot of mortality. 
One of my concerns, especially in working with the abuse population, has been the indiscriminate use of antipsychotic medications. Now, no matter what uh, you have been, may have been told by psychiatrists in the past, uh, and I think some of them may have informed patients well and some of them not so well, what we call antipsychotic medications, and there is a list in your, in your brochure, there are medications like uh, Haldol, Thorazine, Melorel, Celazine, Narvane. These medications have a very toxic effect on the brain. Almost anybody that has a quote-unquote serious psychiatric problem is going to get this medication. Uh, all of them are equally bad. Some of them are stronger and some of them are weaker. Medications like Celazine and Polixin and Haldol are about a, a hundred times stronger than now, a lot of times, even general practitioners will often give things like Trilophon or Trival. Trival is a very popular drug among general practitioners. They give it to patients telling them it's an anti-anxiety medication or um, it helps sleep. These medications, I think called antipsychotic medications, have two very serious side effects. And um, one of them is called... It's the easy, the early side effect, which is uh, what we describe as EPS, or extrapyramidal disorder. And these consist of dystonic reactions where whole bodies of muscles just go into a contraction and the person feels like they're in a straitjacket. These are used as chemical straitjackets. These are the immediate side effects. You have an awful feeling of the tongue being very big in your mouth. Uh, you cannot swallow your saliva, these kind of problems. It also causes you to feel very jittery, and this problem is called akathisia. I did part of my training at Metropolitan State Hospital under, under Dr. George uh, Simpson, who is a very well-known authority on these medications, and I spent all my time looking at the problems of over-medication. And invariably, it came from people that had the side effects of medications that would become worse because of the side effects of medication, the doctors and the nurses would see it as these people are getting more agitated and they would give them more medication. You would have people that were so wasted by medication, but the effect, the side effects of medications were so strong that they couldn't keep, stop moving. And they would be crawling on all fours, trying to get at your pantails because they wanted the attention. And you know the kind of attention they got was you gave them some more medication. Now, this is the immediate side effect of medications like Thorazine. There is a more startling and uh, long-term side effect, which we call tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is a disorder of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is like the motor of the mind. These are, this is like your, uh, the top peel of your brain, which is the cortex. And if you take a section, you have uh, the basal ganglia deep inside which is like the mortar of the mind. This is what initiates movement. I don't mean movement just as in starting movement, getting up and going, getting up from a seat, getting up from a bed, but also movement in a big sense, motivation. So what happens is medications like neuroleptic medications lesion the basal ganglia. These are things that can be seen on a PET scan. In later stages, it can be seen on MRIs, and uh, other relatively uh, stronger tests uh, and more available tests. But even today, you can see it on things like PET scans. Anybody that gets medications like this over a period of three months can develop tardive dyskinesia. Now, one of the things is people talk about tardive dyskinesia. In your handout, you have a list of all the side effects that you see from this medication, which comes with tardive dyskinesia. The earliest uh, signs of tardive dyskinesia are when you have puckering of the mouth and lips and the tongue doesn't stop moving inside the mouth. There's also a kind of restlessness of the body. Now, none of this is perceived as discomfort. The only times when there might be discomfort is when the jaw starts moving continuously like this and you start having temporomandibular problems. It isn't very nice to have to live with a movement disorder that's never going to go away because that is something that they don't tell you. There are a lot of people that go to psychiatric hospitals and sign consent for these medications. 
In five or six instructions, there is one that says that you might be left with permanent involuntary movements. Now, the one thing that is not clarified is that people don't actually sit you down and tell you, if you take these medications for months or years, you're going to be left with this kind of movement. This kind of movement, or your body's going to get moving rhythmically and you can't stop it. Or you're going to keep moving your legs and you can't stop it. They don't sit down and tell you this. They don't sit down and tell you that you might be left with this for the rest of your life. But what they don't tell you is that when you, when you lesion the part of the brain that has to do with motivation, and you break the connections between that and your cortical structures, you are causing a breakdown of motivation. So there's a lot of young people that go into state hospitals or the psychiatrists because they actually come from a background of great trauma, a lot of pain that they cannot deal with because it has happened at a time when they were really not in touch with words, things that happened to them before they were five, before they were three years old, that is felt inside the body, felt in the mind, felt in a certain kind of agony and emptiness that they cannot tell you about, but which they can feel. It is acted out, it is acted into. Problems of uh, this control, like violent behavior, self-destructive behavior, are the ones that get the most attention. If you sit in the corner under the bridge in a city that is not so nice, you can sit there and hallucinate all day long and nobody's going to bother you. It's only when you impinge on the rest of society that it becomes a problem. And when it becomes a problem for society, the easiest solution is to give them medications like chemical straight jackets. And when you, when you give these medications, you take away from these people who are young and motivated, sometimes the brightest and the best amongst us, and you damage their mind. So you have medications that are given routinely to people. Literally hundreds of thousands of people in this country are being medicated with these medications when they don't need to be. In my opinion, probably 100 or maybe 150th of the people that need these medications are getting it. I really believe that maybe 95 percent of all people that get medications like this and who have their minds and their personalities being damaged or destroyed don't need to be taken. There are better medication alternatives and there are a whole bunch of things that you can do without having to take medication. So this is the, one of the reasons why I got into this because I was seeing the abuses of psychiatry and it just hurt me to know that you took people that could, that could become strong on their own if they had not had this interface with quote-unquote mental health and essentially destroyed them. And uh, this is one of the very strong reasons why I felt that I need to give lectures like this so I could inform the public about, for example, when these medications are appropriate, which is almost never, and uh, what other alternatives are there. We have to start out with why people are given these medications. And it comes because, as with other kind of problems, codependency, which is, okay, let me, do, let me take a moment to define codependency. The way I define codependency is that somebody whose feelings, moods, behaviors, and thoughts are very strongly and uncontrollably connected to another person, okay? It might be, and the person changes. It, it starts out with their parents, and it goes on to their relationships, their friendships, their male-female relationships, their employers, and finally their children. It is a contagious disease because if you hang out too much with people that are codependent and who don't work through their codependency, you become infected with it. Uh, it is multi-generational because it is passed on in families. In fact, it is passed on in families at a non-verbal time, right at the time of birth. We are talking about mothers that have no support, who are codependent, their bo abusive boyfriends or husbands become very depressed cling on to their babies for their own needs, neglect their babies, form a kind of unhealthy bonding at a very early age where a child, instead of seeing adoration in the eyes of its mother, only sees pain, fear, or nothing. And this is the roots of codependency. At a very, very young age, a child, instead of learning to feel wonderful about its, or its body, is constantly having to think about the environment constantly having to think about how mommy or daddy is feeling. And this is the mental set of a child growing up in a codependent who later grows up to become a codependent. 
either they have rage around them. Anyway, this is like the, the beginning of codependency. But you, you kind of have to take a look as to why people get abused within the system and how does a person know that they're codependent, which kind of define codependency. Is everybody kind of clear about codependency? Okay, now we talk about abuse. Because I started out with abuse. I started out working with people coming from a background of abuse. And uh, it, it dawned upon me eventually that it was one and the same population, codependence and abuse. And what seems like common sense now didn't seem like common sense at one time. Uh, it comes very easy for me to recognize that if you have been brought up with love and respect, you are not going to go into a relationship where you are not respected. And there will be all kinds of red lights going on, and you don't have to wait, wait until you get pounded on for the 150th time in the year, or have to bail out your significant other for the 10th time, that maybe there is something that's not okay here. See, because People that come from backgrounds of love and respect will not take such things. It is the people who have gotten used to a world and then either they are abused or they become abusive that will be drawn into relationships with abuse of an abusive type. So first of all, you got to find out from all the signals since codependents and abuse victims are not going to know for a variety of reasons why they are hurting and what their problems are and you need to have the power to recognize if, in fact, abuse is a part of your background before you go out and get labeled. There are some uh, specific signs and symptoms that you use because they, they come under this large category of uh, disorders that we call post-traumatic stress disorder. You've heard the term post-traumatic stress disorder in reference to Vietnam veterans and stuff. And this is where a lot of my working knowledge with, with trauma, including trauma of childhood, came from. Some of the things that I look for in uh, adult survivors and codependents, uh, and I encourage them to look at it themselves, is a lack of blossoming. To me, this is the number one thing. I'm not talking about the people that uh, attempt suicide 15 times. There are many, and my, I feel for them. I'm not talking about people that are grossly obese, have periods of intense anxiety and panic, lose control of their bladder and bowel as adults. All that is very painful and all that needs to be attended to. But to me, the biggest single symptom, if I may say, is a lack of blossoming. You have these people with so much strength, so much love, who have gone through the worst kind of nightmares and who are still able to come out of it and still hold on to some sense of self-love and some sense of a capacity to hope and be in this world. When I'm not sure that I would have been able to get up from bed having to go through the kind of things that they've gone through. So when these people don't express their creativity, their capacity for love, and kind of dwindle on, working at 50%, kind of half, half blossom through life, and not recognizing what is holding them back. What is holding them back is the nightmare and the web of lies that they have lived with, okay? So when I see somebody that I intuitively recognize as being relatively bright but who has had a lot of mishaps, they seem to be self-defeating. Uh, they work up to their PhDs but don't write the right papers or uh, they almost get a nice job and then they find somebody that's sure to knock them down. Uh, people that should be up there but are here or here. And to me, this is the largest majority of people that are codependents and suffer from the consequence of abuse. Not enough self-respect, not enough self-love, not enough motivation, not enough blossoming. Chronic feelings of depression and hopelessness. Chronic feelings of rage. Chronic feelings of boredom. Now you have to see, things like hopelessness and, and boredom don't come... If you, these are things learned at a very early age. People that have learned before the age of three what it is to be loved and soothed are not going to have problems with boredom where they're compelled to go out and find some jerk and pay a price daily for that pleasure, okay? Boredom is a sense of a lack of love. Boredom is like this half-brother to rage and depression. It's, got, it's linked hands with both. 
Boredom is what becomes rage at some point. Boredom is what becomes depression and hopelessness. It's a very infantile fe feeling. Hopelessness is a similar state. An adult really cannot get hopeless for persistent periods of time. At, in an adult state of mind, it is really not possible to have persistent states of hopelessness. Okay? Because it is only in childhood that we can feel totally hopeless. And that sense of hopelessness comes because people that are supposed to love us and hold us and protect us are not there or, in many instances, turn against us. So when there is persistent hopelessness or as it cannot be gotten over, then you're really looking at the possibility of abuse in your background, okay? That has not been dealt with. Many people get out of hopelessness by pushing it out. It's like somebody that is suicidal one day, and then they're fine the next day. One phone call is all it takes them to drive them out of their hopelessness. Well, their hopelessness hasn't gone away, and it's just not been dealt with. When somebody has an overwhelming amount of unreasonable, out-of-control behavior, you're looking at the possibility of abuse. Now, this might sound like generalization, but most people that have had a relatively normal, loving childhood are not going to get continuously out of control, okay? Um, because they can reason with themselves. It is when the child within is in constant agony and, and is suppressed all the time that it breaks through and takes over like a monster. We have to talk to the monsters inside us because if you don't talk to them, because they're, they're your children as much as anybody else, and if you don't talk to them, and if you don't listen to them, if you don't hear their crying, then it's going to have you screaming. So listening to the child inside and the wounds inside is a very, very important thing, something you stress all the time. A third important factor in addition to chronic feelings of depression, hopelessness, rage, and boredom is uh, anxiety, fear, and panic that don't seem to respond with, with little amounts. I mean, it cannot be connected to actual events that are happening. Now, all of us may go through periods of depression. When we lose somebody, it's normal to feel depressed. Events can make us depressed, but it's this unconnectedness to external events. People having periods of hopelessness, periods of depression, seemingly unconnected, or vastly out of proportion to what is happening. I've seen people with a history of great trauma in childhood deal with it as they block it off. They block it off completely, and you have amnesia for childhood events. When I see somebody that has very little recall for events in their childhood, especially before they were eight, before they were 12, then I begin to strongly suspect that some abuse may have taken place, or a lot of abuse may have taken place, because for most of us that have had relatively stable and relatively non-traumatic childhood, we were able to kind of assimilate the hurts. It's not that anybody, that none of us go through pain in childhood. All of us go through pain in childhood. But we are held and stroked by people that love us, take care of us, and the sense of love and compassion and holding and adoration from our parents allows us to heal the wounds. You can have a relatively small act of dehumanizing take place in infancy, that in an unsoothing, unloving environment becomes very traumatic. I talk about the butcher and his son. You know, you have the butcher take his son, and he sits there and he sings with him as he, uh, as he cuts open the lambs and disembowels them, singing as he works, talking to his son, and this whole gory thing is not perceived with terror because there is a very strong connection with the father who recognizes and teaches the child that though this is not a nice thing, it is something that is part of our world. So a child like that can learn to soothe himself because it learns this from the parent. Children that come from backgrounds of, uh, of uh, parents that are abusive or that are themselves very depressed lack this capacity for self-soothing, lack this capacity to kind of assimilate these hurts. The only way that they know how to deal with these hurts is to push it behind. And then you have uh, problems like what we call dissociative disorders, multiple personality disorders, and these are the really more sane doctors. Or 
diagnosed as uh, schizophrenia, manic depressive illness. So, uh, I've written some of some of the others, obsessive compulsive. And each of them have a certain kind of meaning. I mean, you have, so well, everybody knows about depression. Manic depressive illness. Manic depressive illness is where you have mood things. Now, I really do believe that there is a certain segment of people that have, quote unquote, manic depressive illness. And uh, I believe that it has a very strong genetic type of loading. I don't think that every parent that has manic depressive gene has manic depressive gene is going to have a child that has manic depressive illness. I think it takes a combination of things for, for the illness itself to be manifest. And I think at some point in time through our genetic work and uh, through our electrophysiologic tests and things like the PET scan, we're going to find definite evidence for th that population which is in fact manic depressive. But I'm talking about maybe a hundredfold times that or literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people that get diagnosed as manic depressive. Before my time, the style in America among psychiatrists was to diagnose anybody that had hallucinations as being schizophrenic. Schizophrenia equals hallucinations. My feeling is that almost everybody hallucinates some time or the other. I believe that everybody hallucinates as children. Hallucinations are not some kind of ominous symptom that needs for you to run down and get this bottle of Thorazine. It isn't. I mean, there are literally thousands and thousands of reasons why people have hallucinations. Almost everything that you put into your body, almost everything in your environment, too much or too little, too much glucose, too little glucose, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, uh, hepatic dysfunction, you know, causing your enzymes not to break down right, uh, lack of sleep, a change from one place to another, parental separation, parental death, high fever, different kinds of brain conditions, brain infections, the amount of things that will cause a person to hallucinate, it's, it's, there's, no, there's almost no end to it. A blow on the head, you know, but one of the very large causes of hallucinations in this population of abuse victims is that they've had very traumatic things happen to them in childhood and it's all been blocked off and periodically when there are triggers in the environment somebody that talks to, th talks to them like their uh, parent or step-parent uh, situations that remind them of what happened causes all of this to come out and flood the mind and their ego, which is their capacity to kind of hold it together, cannot keep it together, and then you have loss of reality testing, which is hallucinations and things like that. You can have any kind of hallucination. Uh, you can feel that somebody's touching you, you can feel different uh, kind of odors, you can start seeing things, hearing things, and all this can happen just as, ha as a part of having to deal with a, with a lot of traumatic things in childhood that have not But this used to be the index by which you diagnose schizophrenia. If somebody hallucinated, that means they were schizophrenic, that means they needed thorazine. Well, you know, I mean, clearly it's not true. Then the fashion became to diagnose people as manic depressive, which means anybody that has mood swings is manic depressive. Uh, and if you had mood swings and uh, you had uh, psychotic symptoms, then you are manic depressive with psychotic. You are a little bit luckier because if you are manic depressive, you got treated a little bit better. People felt more hope. If you have seen schizophrenics in state hospital settings, the kind of attitude that people have towards schizophrenics is that they're essentially humanity that has been written off. So you don't treat them with love and respect. When I trained at the VA, it was like, 80% of the people that are at the VA were being diagnosed as schizophrenic or manic depressive. 
These were not people that could be your brothers or your mothers or your sisters or your brothers or your friends. I mean, these were like the... You could not relate to them. You were told that they had an illness that separated you from them. They were not one of you. And this is the kind of environment that I was... that I learned psychiatry. So I was coming closer and closer. Manic depressives are a little bit... They talk funny sometimes and they just kind of talk real fast. And, and they picked up shiny things from their environment, but they were still very different from you, you know? They had this label, this genetic thing that was happening to them. So anybody that had mood swings was then manic depressive, and the treatment was lithium. And if they got a little crazy, then you gave them thorazine, same as you did the uh, people with uh, schizophrenia. And then you had obsessive compulsive disorders, people that constantly clean themselves. Now, just think about this for a moment. You have somebody that in very early childhood, long before they could reason out things, was constantly left with a sense of being dirty because they had been sexually molested, because they had been treated like dirt. And then you have hand-washing rituals, constant sense of unclean, of not being clean, and then you have things like obsessive compulsive disorders. That is not to say that there are not people that have certain kind of brain lesions that actually account for obsessive compulsive disorders. But we have technology today that is able to pick up people that have these very biologic forms of obsessive compulsive disorder and differentiate them from the other 98% that just get put on drugs because they're arbitrarily diagnosed as obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm not saying that some of these entities don't exist. It's just a massive arbitrary diagnosis of these conditions by the mental health professions that then causes them so much problems in addition to not being able to deal with the main problem. They are led on a false path many times, disempowered by people outside instead of being able to take charge. To walk out of their bad dreams. We talk of parasy. Okay, so we talk, we talk of eating disorders, chemical dependency. Now, all of these people need to keep in mind that maybe they have been misdiagnosed, that maybe their problems don't come from these simple labels. Chemical dependency. Now, you, I ask people, if you, if you feel good within yourself and you feel content and happy, are you going to be addicted to chemicals? Are you going to look, are you going to reach out for a bottle of alcohol or cocaine if you have if you don't have some kind of pain that you cannot reach at. Alcoholics and, uh, and the chemically dependent people are so much sunk in their denial, it becomes a family pathology. It is always in the family, and this is one of the things that I want to impress upon all of you. It's always a family thing. Within the families, they, they learn that the way in which you deal with pain is to keep one hand on your mouth and then feed yourself or drink yourself so you don't have to deal with these with the pain. You don't have to deal with anger, you don't have to deal with pain, all of these things. And then it becomes a, a habit. And, the, and as time goes by, it becomes a very easy fix. Anytime there is a problem, you use chemicals and you're going to feel better. And in my opinion, there is, a, there is this whole, whole population of women that go to general practitioners and get their chemicals from the general practitioners without having to go to the streets and make their buy. I've also noticed that a lot of people, as they get older, are chemically dependent people with problems with heroin and, and uh, cocaine and things like that, invariably go back to drinking alcohol because uh, it is less, you are taking a lot less chances walking down to your 7-Eleven than having to wander in the streets of Compton trying to uh, make a deal. Okay, let me talk of paraphilia. Paraphilia are sexual, uh, sexual disorders, disorders of uh, sexual um, habits, sexual addictions. So child molestation, exhibitionism, pseudo-masochistic sex, uh, cross-dressing, all of these problems come from, uh, they come under the term of paraphilia. So these are Para is similar and philia is love, so disturbances of love or per perversions of love. And then we have personality disorders. I'm sure that uh, any of you that have had contact with uh, psychologists and psychiatrists are familiar with, with uh, personality disorders or character pathology. 
By character pathology, it means that this is the way you are, and too bad, you can't change it. See, this is, the, this is the mold you were made in. And yes, you may be depressed, or you may be anxious, but the bottom line is, this is your cast, and this is what you have to live with. There are many kinds of, of uh, character disorders, as uh, are described in psychiatry. The, com the one commonly used for adult survivors of uh, child abuse and codependence is borderline personality disorder. When I did my residency at UCI, people, women that you didn't like and who kept coming in pain to your emergency room, you diagnosed as borderline personality disorder. Yeah. It was just another term for weak people that were flakes. And this is what angers me because in, in working with adult survivors of child abuse, I came to realize that these were people with very, very great strength who had survived immense amount of physical torture, mental torture, and sexual abuse, and intrusion into their bodies and their minds when they were very, very little. Have people that were supposed to protect them and love them, brutalize them, and they survived all of these things only to come into a, a civilized world of mental health professionals to be so labeled. When the very foundations of self-love and uh, identity are damaged, a, a male child is not allowed to feel like a male because its parent or step-parent sexually abuses them. A female child becomes like a prostitute at an early age because it is dehumanized. Because the moment a child is sexually abused by a parent, that parent has lost the credibility for being a parent. In the mind of the child, he or she will still retain and try to hold on to this image as a parent, but at the cost of betraying themselves, of hating themselves, of denying themselves, and forgetting the pain. Okay. This is uh, diagnostic features of multiple personality disorder. Again, this is one diagnosis that is actually fairly common. I don't diagnose it myself and I don't apply the label because in the last three or four years, even among the people that work with abuse victims, it has become a kind of uh, commonly dropped word. And I think it tends to classify people and uh, humanize them. And uh, I therefore tend to use the diagnosis of uh, dissociative disorder, which just means that you have periods of being spacey. Now, that I can relate to. Okay. Shall we go on? Okay. I mean, if any of you want some of this stuff, it can always be, you can write it down in the cards and we can mail it out to you. Okay, this is a letter written by one of uh, my multiple personality disorder patients. And uh, it shows you, this is one of the things that can lead the clinician to diagnose them if they are astute and keep this in mind. Uh, difference of handwriting. Okay. Uh, this is the same person with a different handwriting. So it's like separate selves, and these separate selves are created. I mean, you have one pair, sometimes you have a parent that's nice and bubbly and stroking and kind, and then in, in the middle of the night, the same parent is uh, knocking at your door, wanting to put you in a chokehold and put things between your legs. And uh, how do you deal with that? How, do you, how does a seven-year-old girl go to the classroom of her seven-year-old classmate and pull all, all of this together? Okay? You put it together by forgetting it. You put it together by creating kind of like separate personalities that don't kind of keep touch with each other. You create this, you do this by creating a fantasy life. You do this by, by restructuring reality. And reality around you is so horrendous and unbearable than you by rearranging reality. Okay. Okay, let me have the lights on. You have just heard a talk by psychiatrist Mohan S. Nair, MD medical director and founder of the ASCA Co-Dependency Centers of Bellflower, California. 
The centers specialize in inpatient and outpatient treatment and education and training to promote better understanding of codependency and abuse. For additional information, you may phone 213-866-5810.
to paraphilic and uh, sexual addicts, dehumanized. You've got to look at the possibility of having had come from a background of abuse, including sexual abuse. Now, I must tell you that it doesn't mean that every person that, is, has a sec that has sexual addiction problems has been sexually abused. I think a large number of them have been. But you can also talk about a child that comes from an environment that is so impoverished that the only way of keeping in touch with reality and, and having some sense of feeling good comes from constantly touching themselves. So you have a child that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old that is constantly masturbating. It doesn't always mean that they have been sexually abused, but they are abusing themselves in a sort of way. And these people can also become sexual addicts at a later time. But it always talks about some kind of abuse and deprivation, but very often sexual. As uh, among the people that are educated about the subject, you know that the, there is increasing numbers of males that are coming out and describing themselves as having been sexually abused. And, but the numbers for women is about one out of five, and the numbers for men is about one out of ten. And these are conservative estimates. So. The thing about sexual abuse that makes it different from uh, physical and mental abuse is that it's hard to explain away this action. You can somehow get yourself to, you can convince yourself with a lot of work that uh, your father meant in your best interest when he punched your teeth out for chewing with your mouth open at the dinner table. And it was because he wanted to make you a man of etiquette. But uh, for a child that has been sexually abused by its parent, it is something that they just cannot come to grips with. And they simply cannot explain away why, some, why it would be in their best interest that their parent abuse them. What they are left with is a web of lies about themselves what they are left with is guilt. Because children, even children that are compelled to have sexual intercourse by adults, come away with a feeling of guilt. They feel that they may have, en they feel they have enjoyed it. Now, you blindfold the child and stimulate their genitals, they're going to get excited. But what is left with that excitement is a terrible sense of guilt. And this is the reason why this guilt gets compartmentalized. It becomes the roots of low self-esteem. You have good people that cannot look you in the face. People that walk around like zombies because they have to hide this shame. They have to hide this guilt. They have to compartmentalize it. Live with the feelings but not have the memories. And this is the reason why sexual abuse is very, very deeply hidden away. I have known people that have been abused for 15, 20, and 30 years by their parents and step-parents and have and don't remember it when they come to your office. These, these things remain compartmentalized. So there is something different about sexual abuse and something much more grievous in the kind of wounds that it causes, in my opinion. <clears throat> you have physical problems like very strongly uh, psychosomatically and psychophysiologically. Psychosomatic is strongly connected with body and mind. Psychophysiologic is where there are actually physiologic changes taking place uh, because of stress. And we're talking about migraine headaches, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, pelvic cysts, persistent cysts, problems of the stomach, uh, chronic back and neck pain, things like this. Uh, female problems, uh, excessive bleeding, painful bleeding, exaggerated PMS. Now I have to tell you that every person that goes through that have these problems need not necessarily have come from an abuse, but anybody having this problem with some of the other problems must maintain a high index of suspicion that they may have been abused in childhood. Uh, I've had women, for example, that have gone to their gynecologist and found uh, lots of lacerations in their, in their vagina and, that, and scar tissue, and then it has come to them in the form of flashbacks that they've been abused. Uh, in my opinion, what happens is Children that have been subjected to a tremendous amount of stress, age, fail to develop the kind of harmonious rhythms in their neuroendocrine system. Let me see, I'm looking for a... Let's see if I have a picture. So right at the top you have your cerebral cortex. Uh, this is where all the thinking stuff takes place. And underneath that you have the feeling 
part of the brain, very roughly speaking. And uh, after that you have the spinal cord, and along the spinal cord you have the autonomic nervous system, which has to do with controlling uh, your, all your uh, uh, unconscious processes, uh, heartbeat, gut, bladder, things like that. And then you have uh, the endocrine system, which is uh, the pituitary, uh, the hypothalamus, which is part brain and part gland. You have the pituitary, you have the parathyroids, you have the thyroids, you have the adrenal cortex, and you have the ovaries of the testes, depending on the men or women. Now, all of these glands have a certain rhythm. And in early infancy and childhood, when the brain develops, that's the time that this rhythm is set, okay? The daily waking and sleeping, activity when they sleep, enrichment, stimulation, excitement when they, that keeps them awake, that keeps their reticular activating system going. Love and excitement makes their brain grow full of, full of things, full of magic. And then night puts them to sleep. And it is in this rhythm of sleeping and waking that the, that the brain becomes molded in this environment of love that this, that this brain gets a certain kind of rhythm. The glands get their rhythm. And I have found that, ch that children, that, that people that come from a background of abuse, where they've had to spend sleepless nights waiting to be intruded upon, have their ears closed with their fingers because they don't want to hear the screaming in the other room, or the out of control sexual activity, or their mother's fifth boyfriend slapping her across the, across the room. If they don't want to live with it, their waking and sleeping becomes disturbed they lose what we call the architecture of sleep. And uh, there is a certain kind of balance of REM sleep and non-REM sleep and all of these things. And what happens in people that comes in, come from a background of abuse is that they don't have these internal rhythms. Therefore, they suffer from chronic sleep disturbances. Therefore, they suffer from chronic disturbances of the different kind of glands. You have obesity problems. You have shifts of, uh, of, uh, of eating on both sides. You have all kind of what we call endocrinopathies, just little changes in the endocrines. Feeling weak, feeling tired, chronic feelings of fatigue. Uh, and these, the thing you've got to know is these are things that can be tested today. Today you can do eight or nine tests that will tell you that you've got an endocrine system that's mildly out of whack and maybe it has something to do with the fact that you never got it in the first place. And these are the things that you need, you need to know these things because Knowledge is power in a very immediate way, and knowledge is power, because if you don't know these things, you're going to have to listen to somebody else's answers as to why it's happening. You know, you need to empower yourself with this knowledge, okay? So, I believe that early uh, abuse and stress uh, and a lack of love and a horrendous type of early environment causes this kind of chronic problems, and then you have chronic problems with sleep. So, when we talk of treating all of these things, one of the first things that I address is treating sleep. We'll come back to that. So first thing you've got to, you've got to understand and recognize the fact that maybe your problems, maybe your lack of blossoming or your persistent suicidal tendencies, uncontrollable suicidal tendencies, your bulimia, your tendency to be drawn towards the worst person in the crowd, all of this come from a background of abuse. You've got to make that connection and you've got to keep that connection. You always have to remind yourself because your brain is always working to hide it, because that is how you have survived childhood. You, so your brain works, get it. So you have to work very hard at keeping yourself reminded. That is why thinking about childhood, listening to childhood, exploring your dreams of childhood, going through your old magazines uh, or your photo albums, journaling, exploring your dreams, talking to people that have known you in childhood, all is very important. For people that have not been tremendously traumatized, they're going to remember most of their uh, a good part of their childhood. It is the people that have been hurt most of all and who have the most serious problems very often that we have to go on to more elaborate and sometimes more intrusive methods such as uh, uh, we do in uh, clinic and hospital settings like hypnosis and sodium amytal interviews. But since we are talking about empowerment, you got to know that there are many, many things that all of you can do to get in touch with childhood all on your own without having to go to a clinic, without having to go to a doctor. Not everybody needs to get hypnosis. Not everybody needs to have intrusive procedures like sodium amytal interviews. But then 
There are people that are going to need them, and those are the people that have been struggling with their problem for 8 or 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, a lifetime, being misdiagnosed, being given brain-damaging medications, uh, without really getting to the roots of the problem. And I think for those people who simply cannot get in touch with what happened in childhood, things like sodium amytal interviews and the hypnosis are helpful. Uh, some of the other symptoms uh, uh, that, I, uh, that I use as, as uh, guides for looking at abuse is, uh, is uh, loss of bladder and bowel control. I've seen a lot of women in, in their uh, 30s and 40s that have quote-unquote stress incontinence or just lose control of the bladder. And you always want to look at the possibility of them having to deal with great fear in their childhood. Because you often hear the expression, I will scare the S out of you. So it's that because what, what happens is fear goes from, when it cannot be dealt with in a reasonable manner, affects the, the non-unconscious part of the brain, and then it goes into the autonomic nervous system. There is an autonomic overload, and this causes an autonomic imbalance, and so this fine-tuned control of parasympathetic and sympathetic control goes out of whack, and that's the time people have things like diarrhea and, uh, and uh, loss of bladder control, and shaking and things like hyperventilation, things like palpitations, all the general, generally recognized anxiety symptoms. So, what's the problem with misdiagnosis? You know, it's very common. We've kind of, I've, I have uh, told you that it's a very common thing. One-fifth of women and one-tenth of men in this country have had some exposure to some kind of uh, sexual abuse. Double or triple that for uh, emotional abuse. Uh, it takes between 8 and 13 years for some of these problems to be caught. Uh, that is going to therapists. Misdiagnosis is very common. What are some of the problems that people have when they go to therapists and why is it not recognized? A lot of it, I feel, comes just from the whole attitude within the community of, uh, of uh, psychiatry and mental health. More in psychiatry to a lesser degree in uh, psychology and to an even lesser degree in uh, in the fields that primarily have more women. Uh, but there is a very adult type of attitude, which means we are adults, we're not children, so we don't listen to the voices of children. Okay? We have a very masculine attitude. Even those who, have, who are women who have come into UYN don't listen. They've already trained this feminine sign, uh, side of them out of it. They may save it for their husbands, but they don't save it for their patients. Uh, there is also a society attitude that encourages not listening to children, okay? Children and women are not to be heard. You've heard the old, children are to, uh, to be, uh, <laughs> that's right, okay, <laughs> okay. And then, as we get to be adults, abused children go on to abusing their own inner child. And that is the biggest crime, and that is the one crime that you have the handle on. From the time that you know that there is something inside, that is somebody inside you hurting, that is the time to make the change. You must never close your eyes or never close your ears to that voice inside you. People may not come and tell you about their abuse, and, and that is one thing that therapists have to know all the time. You have learned to hide your shame because it is connected to your own guilt. You have learned to hide it because you're afraid of talking about it. People have seen, children have seen what comes from talking about it. Oftentimes it's more punish punishment. So patients have many reasons why they don't come in touch with uh, their abuse. They may lie to protect their own guilt, be afraid of talking about it, because it's, especially men, and, and I think this is very great with the male abuse population. They are even more afraid of coming out and talking about abuse. Uh, in the last few years, there has been a tendency where we have encouraged women uh, empower women with being able to talk about their abuse. It's still very hard for men to come out. And the kind of expressions of male abuse, which very often times is molestation in themselves, having paraphilic tendencies is something you don't want to talk about. People don't talk about things like, I feel like molesting little children. You simply don't talk about it. This, it doesn't matter about exploring these things, about looking at maybe there is a lot of pain that inside this person that causes them to have this kind of loss of control. Never mind that. These are not things you bring up. And society is very harsh in dealing with people like this. They incarcerate them, they shame them, they punish them, they brutalize them, 
and they expect them to get better when this is all the result of shame. You also have other problems such as denial and repression and then you have the amnesia barrier which prevents a person coming in touch with the pain. In the very young some of, uh, and the adolescent population, some of the indicators of uh, sexual abuse, again, are, are abuse, are persistent for those you know, that are therapists here or those who have children. Persistent and uh, bedwetting, sleepwalking, severe disturbances of sleep, nightmares, uh, a persistent sadness, talking of suicide, extreme withdrawal, psychotic type of behavior, hallucinations, things like that, all of that. You've got to look at the possibility that maybe inside the home or outside the home, somewhere in their environment, they're being traumatized. Runaway behavior should make you think about it. And you look at it, you know, sometimes for an adolescent to run away from home is probably the healthiest thing. You've got a very brutalizing environment and uh, a discounting environment, an environment where they're being physically brutalized or sexually abused. It is strength for such a child to, to leave. Uh, a home. Misdiagnosis comes from uh, looking at all the multiple uh, effects that abuse uh, brings on. Behavioral problems such as sexual addiction, sexual uh, self, uh, behavioral problems. Now you talk of behavioral things because this is what people notice and that's how they diagnose things. Uh, sexual addiction, self-mutilation, hyperactivity in children, anxiety, panic where you're actually doing things uh, and acting out with chemicals and uh, chemicals and uh, eating disorder, mood changes, thought problems, for example, hearing things, seeing things, things like that, uh, and personality disturbances. These are the areas in which therapists and doctors make misdiagnosis, and this is why you need to keep in touch with why these things may be happening. Uh, what are some of the dangers? For example, well, the biggest problem is that it is a repeat of the betrayal that you've gone through. It's one more time in which people have betrayed you. Uh, what I find is that people coming from a background of abuse alternate between, in a childlike manner, they're either very mistrustful or they're excessively trustful. But the one thing is they're always trusting people that they shouldn't trust. And then as time goes by, they become increasingly trustful because every person that they manage to find from this crowd is somebody that mistreats them and abuses them all over again and this tells them that they, can, that they cannot trust people. And so as they get older, they become more and more mistrustful. In their 40s, 50s, and 60s, they become paranoid, and, and then they get labeled as paranoid, schizophrenic, etc., etc. So a lot of people coming from a background, I often ask my parents, what was your, they come from a background of abuse. What was your, what was your grandmother's problem? She was diagnosed as schizophrenic. How was she when she was young? Uh, she was okay when she was young. In her 40s and 50s, she was locked up in such and such state hospital because she became very, very paranoid. Well, abuse is a multi-generational problem and oftentimes in the lives of these same grandmothers there has been abuse because it is people that are abused that oftentimes cannot see abuse. It is oftentimes in the, in the homes of women that themselves have been abused that, they, that a situation develops where the children are abused. So, we have to be caring of, of the full family. We cannot just focus on, on the child and say uh, that it is all the fault. Well, it is the fault of the parents, but then the fallen parents are victims themselves, and you have to treat the whole family when it comes to something like this. Uh, there is abuse within the therapeutic community. Abuse as in the abuse of drugs, as we have talked about it. Abuse as by not giving them the right treatment. You also have abuse such as uh, sexual abuse. Now, for those people that are not from within the therapeutic community, it is hard to believe that, that therapists will actually abuse their patients. But it's true. I have many, many patients that have come to me who have been sexually abused by their therapists. And it happens for a reason. These same therapists, I mean, it doesn't condone anything that the therapist does. Don't get me wrong. But it does happen to people that come from a background of abuse that they get abused again and again. They give out these signals to these people and they don't know how not to give out these signals to these people. Uh, sexual signals because they have connected intimacy with sex. Love with, not love with respect, but sex with purely as a way of getting. 
One thing I recognize is that uh, sexual addicts, uh, people coming from backgrounds of prostitution, uh, mud wrestling, escorts, all of these, where in a way they allow themselves to be dehumanized, sex for money, etc. That there is always a history of abuse in the background because people that have not learned to dissociate love from love and respect, love and sex, are not going to be able to do these kind of things. You cannot walk up to somebody, a crowd of people that you don't know, and take off your clothes while they're sipping beer or, and walk three, inch, three feet away from their faces and flash your groin at them. Normal people cannot disconnect from such feelings because it produces all kinds of reactions within them. It is people that have been subjected to dehumanized sex that are going to perform dehumanizing actions of sex, uh, including prostitution. There is always molestation. I have not seen a person that has become a prostitute who has not had molestation. I read uh, uh, the book by the, the one that uh, acted in Deep Throat. And I believe that this is a person who has not come in touch with her molest because uh, she takes her father to see uh, one of her latest... Can you imagine this? And she never mentions abuse. There is her husband that has, been, that has been having her in pornographic films, lending her out to the dentist, lending her out to the chiropractor to get his work done. And then he calls her to a hotel room with cameras and everything going, and he has a couple of guys come and gangbang her. And then she's surprised that this wonderful husband of hers should subject her to something like this. It is because the signals and people that are abused don't go off at the right time. It is because there are large covers on their recall, large things that, that suppress their past. <laughs> we also have problems with codependent therapists and, and uh, doctors because a lot of people go into the field out of their need to get people better. I don't, I'm not saying that I am uh, better than anybody else or anything of that kind, but the one thing I have to tell you is that Somebody that I meet at the beach or at the ball game is just as important as somebody that is agonizing or wants to die. I can see that they are in more pain. I used to do surgery before and I'm, I'm, I have seen death at close quarters a lot of times. But it doesn't, doesn't make me more endeared to them just because they are in physical agony. I mean, they don't become more important human beings. But there are a lot of people who, need to, who have this need to save. So therefore, they will go through long periods of uh, treating people without confronting them, without making them, compelling them to take, take charge. Seeing people in therapy month after month, year after year, not addressing problems that are needed, never asking, why did you put on another 15 pounds, or why did you miss the appointment last time? Basically, co-depending their patients. Nobody, in my opinion, nobody should be in therapy for years and years. There is no reason why anybody should be in therapy for years and years. There is no condition that a person has as an adult that should not be in a well-set direction of progress in a year's time, preferably in six months' time. Even people that have tremendous amount of amnesia, people that have psychotic symptoms, multiple personality disorders, all of the people with eating disorders, nobody should have to suffer endlessly. And it is, again, the codependent and the feeling of powerlessness that makes them feel that somehow life is to be just waited till you're 40 or 45 or 50 and then things can change. You can't, you can't afford to wait. Do you think about death, you know? I mean, how many of you think about death? I think about death all the time, all the time. It sits on my shoulder all the time. And what it does for me is that it makes me strong. It tells me that I cannot waste a moment today in terms of what I have to do, who I have to love, and what I have to say, because I might not make it to tomorrow, you know. We all have to live with the thought that not only that we might die, we might die in great agony, we might die in, in a long period, it might take a, a lingering death, we might be dismembered, we live in L.A., there's people dying on the streets all the time, there's people that blow people away. You can't wait. You simply cannot wait. Waiting is part of not feeling powerful. You simply cannot wait and let the days fitter away thinking that someone or something is going to change. The one thing that I hope when you leave this place 
is feel empowered with knowledge and also make the decision to change your lives. Not just a thought in your head, but something that gets acted upon. Okay? The other problems with... Um, Okay, so you have uh, misdiagnosis and being in touch with codependent therapists that kind of let you linger on in your sickness, not enforcing things like exercise, not enforcing things like taking good care of your medical problems, which comes secondarily to not making your body strong and not sharing, these kind of things. Uh, not being strong enough in terms of confronting the person with their codependent relationships, their habits, their chemical dependencies, all of these things. Uh, The, the other problems with, uh, with misdiagnosis, addiction to uh, worsening of medical problems, worsening of obesity, which is very often a consequence of abuse and denial of abuse, hypertension, back and neck pain, things like that, becoming uh, narcotic pain medication addicts, and of course some of the long-term problems of using medications such as, uh, such as uh, uh, thorazine and things like that that I've mentioned. I also need to mention in passing that even though that some of you may not know that both alcohol and cocaine can cause very severe chronic disturbances of the brain. In fact, alcohol, even though people may tell you LSD makes you crazy and stuff like that, and a lot of it is true, uh, the most dangerous drug today is alcohol followed by cocaine. And alcohol is the one thing that we, can, we have known only for the last two to three years that, that cocaine causes lesions. Uh, you're looking at uh, the blood flow in their brains and which parts of the brain are active and which are inactive. You find certain patterns in depression, certain patterns in mild degrees of brain injury, and you find certain patterns in uh, cocaine abuse where you find little spots all over the brain, both in the cortex and inside, that make them look like they got senile dementia, which is like old age related brain rot. Uh, so. So this is the technology that we use, and these, this is what this, the PET scan, uh, electroencephalograms, uh, beams, these are the kind of tests that we do today that a good clinician ought to do that will tell us very clearly if this is a brain-related problem or this is something more related to things that are from your past that you have not dealt with, or is it a combination of both, because we cannot exclude it. Okay. So both cocaine and alcohol cause lasting changes in the brain. Uh, cocaine causes lasting changes in the brain, it can also affect the heart. The alcohol, on the other hand, causes a tremendous amount of brain damage. It affects every part of the brain. It affects the part that thinks, that remembers, the part that controls the mood, the part that has to do with balance. It also affects the peripheral nervous system, all the nerves that go to the different parts of your body. It affects every, part, every organ in your body. One thing that I like to tell adolescents that drink uh, as well as adults, is that it causes testicular atrophy. It means you have all these ads for, pe for all these macho people that are drinking beer, but the consequence of drinking any kind of alcohol for long periods of time is that your testicles become soft and they go away. They disappear inside your scrotum. So this is one thing you want to tell males that drink. If you drink for long periods of time, it causes testicular atrophy. And this is not something that is... Uh, that is something I'm telling to scare people. I worked at the VA and I used to spend whole days doing this kind of thing. I mean, not just feeling their testicles, but also putting big needles into their swollen bellies just so they could walk around. You drain off uh, um, a gallon or two of fluid from their body just so they could be walking around without pain because it's very hard when your stomach comes all this way to be walking around. You know, let's have the lights. Okay, so al when, you, when you choose agents such as alcohol to forget pain and not deal with the hurts of childhood, you are continuously hurting the mind. One thing that you have to do in terms of recovery is stop hurting yourself, whether it's in very direct ways like banging your head as a way of dealing with your pain or drinking or using cocaine or walking away from abusive, physically abusive relationships or shaming relationships. You've got to stop hurting yourself. And that means staying off drugs. Okay. Okay, the, the things that, uh, okay. just to sum up, one thing is knowing and keeping in touch with the knowledge of childhood. Uh, keeping yourself in a safe environment so you can work with this knowledge. That means being with people that are not abusive, 
uh, being in, not being with people that are abusing drugs and alcohol because they are dealing with their pain in a way that you don't want to deal with it. You want to be among people that are recovering. This is one of the reasons why I started the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. The reason why I sent people to codependency groups because they are in an environment of people that are empowering themselves, staying in touch with their pain, so they know where to direct their efforts of love and care. They know where to listen. Stop the abuse from going on on themselves and others, whether it's a job, a husband, a boyfriend, a wife, children, whatever. Exercise. Exercise is an important part of, of self-empowerment because the one thing that people are always hurting and feeling guilty about is having lain there and taken it, not having screamed, not having walked away. Let it happen day after day, night after night, and having to live with the shame of that. And it is, a, it is this apathy that has to be actively fought with exercise. Exercise must be done on a regular basis. It has to be done every morning or preferably early in the day before you start your day. You don't leave it for those times when you've got your favorite boyfriend on with your favorite jogging suit and everything feels wonderful. That is not the day you want to go and exercise. The day you want to exercise is when you feel like shit, when you don't feel like getting out of bed, when the world feels dead to you, when you don't have any power. That's the day that you need to exercise. And again, these things are not going to happen unless you do it by habit. So you have to create good habits. You have to create good habits of exercise, good habits of staying awake in the daytime, doing things that enrich your life, you must get from nature and the rest of the world and all the wonderful people in this world what you don't get from your parents. You cannot carry the web of bad dreams of your parents on your shoulder all the time. You have to let it go and get it from the community, get it from your friends, get it from nature. We have wonderful things today. You know, people talk about the world being so wicked and we have satanical ritualistic abuse going on, we have Hitler, but I'll tell you something. I mean, 6,000 years ago, Genghis Khan killed 6 million people with swords and, and flames. People being inhumane is not a new thing. We always have to live with it. We have to look at it inside ourselves. It's when we don't hear what is going on within ourselves, and we don't hear it in our children, and we don't listen to our children, either as professionals or as parents, and we don't listen to the voices inside ourselves of our inner child, that's when we are running into a problem that's when we dehumanize ourselves. Okay, stabilizing, okay, exercise, being stimulated and doing self-worthy things, not abusing drugs and alcohol. Knowing how to stay by yourself and feeling good, that is part of empowerment. Self-soothing, whether it's by music, fishing. One of the things I tell people all the time is go fishing, okay? Fish don't hurt you, okay? Animals don't hurt you. It's important. You've got to know you can spend your time with yourself, love yourself, not be destructive, and go towards damaging relationships. It's very, very important. And uh, learning how to sleep well. The only medication that I'm, I'm fond of prescribing for sleep, which I think is very important, establishing a good sleep pattern is very important. And I find poor sleep patterns all the time in people that come from traumatic backgrounds. And the one thing I tell them is, you must, you must pay attention to sleep. You mustn't create uh, irregular habits where because somebody that you like came, you are compelled to sit up to 3 o'clock in the morning even though you have to go to work at, at 7. So creating a balanced habit of sleep and waking is very important. It's like stroking. Okay? There, it has greater implications than that. The architecture of sleep d decides the rhythm of your glands. And if the architecture of sleep, the balance between REM sleep and non-REM sleep are not in sync, then every gland in your body becomes disturbed. The growth hormone becomes disturbed. You get anemic because it's the a, it's a pulsations of growth hormone in a rhythmic manner with rhythmic sleep that allows the bones to sprout blood cells. It is what keeps the immune system strong. So. Good sleep and exercise are important parts of staying healthy in body and mind. You can use L-tryptophan to treat sleep because it's an amino acid. People that suffer from very serious sleep disturbances, there is a medication that you might want to write down, which you might want to ask your doctors about, and it's clonazepam. It's, it, you will not find its use in the PDR because it's listed as an anticonvulsant, which is for the treatment of seizures. Okay, but uh, it is very helpful for the kind of 
sleep disturbance that we find in people coming from abuse backgrounds, which is what we describe as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and I, I, had, I had thought of bringing the psychiatric glossary with me, its definition of words, post-traumatic stress disorder, i.e. a mental state and set and symptoms and behaviors brought on, for example, by combat. For those of you among here who've been in combat, I would like you to visualize two scenes. One is being... That is very traumatic. Yes, it's traumatic. Of course it's traumatic to see people that you love being blown up, okay? But t take the other scene of being four or five years old or three years old and having your old man walk up behind you in a drunken rage and put you in a chokehold and put his knees in your back and struggle you to the ground and stick things inside you that he shouldn't be doing, okay? Now which is more horrifying and which is harder to live with, okay? I think that everybody that comes from a background of abuse suffers from a post-traumatic stress disorder that causes them symptoms for a lifetime until they think about the original hurts and empower themselves with that knowledge and learn to go beyond that. But in treating, they also need to treat some of these symptoms and sleep is one of them. So you have, you can take unhealthy medications for sleep because taking medications that are regular hypnotic sedative medications instead of bettering sleep are going to worsen it eventually. You take any sleep medications long enough, it will create a disturbance of sleep, which means even a person that doesn't have a sleep problem will wind up with a sleep problem. Uh, we, talk of, uh, we talk of exercise, walking, running. People often ask me, what about walking? Well, walking is good. It also causes certain kind of chemical changes in the body and mind, but running is different. Running and heavy physical exercise with sweat breaking in your head, having your heart race, feeling a, your muscles twitch, that's the kind of exercise that empowers you. And you've got to do it every day if you want it towards strengthening yourself and fighting the, the passivity of abuse. Okay? Both impulse control problems and passivity because impulse control problems are just the other side of the coin of passivity. It is for people that are not decisive. People that don't feel empowered cannot be decisive. Either they're impulsive or they are apathetic and uh, passive. Okay? So exercise is an important part of the treatment of uh, impulsivity and passivity. I often send my patients, both female and male adults and children, to martial arts classes and their parents or their spouses are often shocked because they think, oh no, it's not good because they'll learn to fight even how, you know, they'll get more out of control. But it's not true because if you feel strong, then you don't need to, f to feel threatened. Okay. Uh, we talk about... Uh, so exercise is an antidote to apathy, to apathy and uh, to uh, impulsivity. Working with rage, you've got to come in touch with the rage. Working with grief, you've got to come in touch with the grief. And every child, that, every person that has gone through abuse in their childhood, there is a lot of rage. They have felt homicidal towards their parents. They have kept this knowledge for themselves. They're ashamed of this knowledge. They don't want to admit it to themselves because they don't have a real strong enough bond with their parents that says that even if I have such horrible thoughts like I have felt like my mother or I have felt rage towards my father where I wanted to see him dead because there is not strong enough of a bond of love they have to hide these feelings and you've got to get in touch with these feelings because everybody or most people go through feelings of anger and sexual feelings towards their parents either they cover it up tremendously or they cover it somewhat but getting in touch with rage, getting in touch with grief, learning to say goodbye to the idealized childhood, learning to say goodbye to the idealized parent, and learning to live with them as parents, as people, with all their limitations, is an important step in discovering your own power. Just like I have to tell people the limits of what I can do to them every time, and I tell them sometimes in very crude ways, such as, even if you plan to jump off the sixth story of the federal building, I'm still going to be out on the beach with my gin and tonic and my kids. I don't do that, you know, but I want them to hear that my life is not going to be changed by what they do and it is not right for me to tell them that somehow I'm going to be able to stop them from committing suicide. They are the only ones that can stop themselves from killing themselves. I tell patients all the time that it takes 15 minutes to kill yourself between checks. So even in a hospital setting, a person can kill themselves. The, the desire and the strength to live must come from, from within. It can never come from outside. And if the desire to live and the need to live comes from outside, it is not worth it. And sooner or later, it is going to do you in.
groups. We talk, okay, before that, we get to massage. Massage and body work, in my opinion, is a very important part of self-love. People that come from a background of abuse either have not been touched and soothed because their parents are too depressed or too much into fighting or not feeling good about themselves. They have not been touched, stroked, handled with love and care. Or, they, or touch has meant for them being brutalized. They have been, touching means being beat on, touching means sexual, uh, being sexually invaded. And for these, those people, their sense of boundaries, their respect for themselves, comes by their also be, You also have to feel empowered to get help. You want to do it before you become so old or so mistrustful that you can't go out there. But you make the decision. You shouldn't think about therapy or going to therapists as something that's from the outside. It is just like if I want to take a shave, I don't feel compelled to pull out every hair. I don't mind buying the latest kind of razor if it helps, okay? It's just a question of getting help. And, you, and it's not, it should not be a counter-dependent decision like, I think one way of proving my power to myself is running away from home. One way of proving my power to myself is not to go and seek a therapist. It is always the people that run away from home when they're 13 and 14 that are at home at the age of 35 fighting with their parents. Okay, so there is no problem when you're young getting help from the outside. You just have to be careful about who you choose. You shouldn't have to be in therapy endlessly. You shouldn't be taking mind-damaging medications. Preferably, you should be taking no medications at all. Uh, okay, you don't want leaning on relationships. You don't want relations that lean on you. You don't want environments that are discounting and, and reinforce your denial. You want a therapist that is 100% with you while they are there, but not somebody that seems to be there endlessly for you, jumping up when you call them at 2 o'clock, again there at 4 o'clock, because there's something wrong with that person if that is all what he's doing, and he may be part of not allowing you to get in part with your self-soothing mechanisms. And that is not empowering, that is this. You have just heard a talk by psychiatrist Mohan S. Nair, M.D., medical director and founder of the ASCA Co-Dependency Centers of Bellflower, California. The centers specialize in inpatient and outpatient treatment and education and training to promote better understanding of codependency and abuse. For additional information, you may phone 213-866-5810.